Hey guys, it's Matt Winning at winningstrength.com and today we're going to talk about a subject that's kind of heavy on everybody's heart right now and that's the the passing of Louis Simmons. So I'm going to give you guys my background story, um, how I met him, uh, what he did to influence me and my training and all the people that I've, I've worked with and um, the falling out and situation in that particular matter. So let's get to it. Lately I've been living like I can't take a loss. So, as a lot of you guys know that's read the powerlifting manual, I started lifting at a very young age. And I was from a smaller town of less than 100,000 people um, and lifted at a local YMCA. And with the limited knowledge that I had, um, I was able to reach a teenage world championships by the age of 19. Now at this 19 year old meet, I bench a little bit under 500 pounds. I'm a mid 600 pound squatter and a mid 600 pound delifter right out of high school. With that being said, I go to the Arnold Classic, which at that time was an amazing venue. Uh, it was all extreme strongman, powerlifting and bodybuilding. Um, it wasn't the fiasco shit show that it is today. Um, I see George Halbert and Kenny Patterson battling it out for the bench bash for cash, which was right in the middle of the Expo Center um, in 1999, and I'm walking with my friend Brad Sheward, and Brad Sheward was a very well-built guy and worked with my mom as a perfusionist in the surgical uh, area of the hospital back in my hometown. Brad Sheward and I go to uh, the Arnold Classic, we see... Dave Tate, Kenny Patterson, George Halbert, and Louis Simmons, and a handful of other guys like Jerry Obradovich and Rob Fuzner walking out of the Arnold Classic into the hall. So they're coming out from the main entrance of the Expo Center into the hallway. They did not hang around the Arnold Classic. They didn't like the Arnold Classic. Um, you know, Westside Barbell, in, in reality, was too extreme for the Arnold Classic as far as the way they trained, and they weren't real big showboaters, and they wanted to just hit big weights. So I see this crowd of massive dudes walking out of the Arnold Classic with Louis Simmons in the middle. And Brad Sheward's like, oh, you need to go talk to Louis. You know, you've maxed out what you can do in Indiana. You need to go and start talking with him and learning how to train. Now, keep in mind, before this happened, I'm already very deep into Powerlifting USA magazine articles, reading on Louis Simmons and not understanding a fucking thing of what he's talking about. Meaning that Nobody in that time, and even today, people refute it, which is completely asinine. But in that day, he was talking about speed work to get stronger. And for most people, even today, they're like, that doesn't make any sense. And I started reading his stuff, and it really, really struck a chord with me that the way I was training, I was starting to get lots of mileage. So I'm 19, almost 20 years old. My shoulders are bothering me. My, my elbows are pissed. My back's not happy. My knees are unhappy. Why? In reality, because I was using linear periodization, I was using old style methods of training, I was getting stronger by building up my reps in the classic lifts versus getting faster and understanding force production and stretch reflex and all of these other things that are amazingly important to getting super strong. So these articles, although they aren't deep into science, they're very deep into practicality. So I start reading these articles and they just blew me away with the amount of physics and the amount of stuff that I just wasn't aware of. It was really an eye-opening experience in the 90s, as everybody else will tell you, to reading stuff that Louis Simmons was putting out. I would say that the only person that was a pioneer of speed work before Louis Simmons was obviously the Russians, which is why people ask me, why do you have a Soviet flag in your gym? This is exactly is to pay homage to the people that I feel created the most superior training system known to man that Louis, myself, and many others have copied and or modified on. Long story short, Fred Hatfield was probably the first Westerner in the early 80s, late 70s to talk about compensatory acceleration and getting faster to getting stronger. Louis Simmons, I believe, built upon that by pushing chains, bands, accommodative resistance, and actually trying to find the right percentages of speed work which to this day we still don't know. 
I find that now, and this is fast forwarding a little bit, and we'll get more into the story, that I went the opposite direction and went lighter, whereas Louis went heavier. And I'll explain some of that maybe at a later date uh, of why I think that he did that. So I go up and I finally get the balls from Brad Sheward pushing me and telling me, you need to go over and talk to him. He pushes me over and I'm super nervous because, I mean, I'm a 275 five or so pound teenager and these dudes are three wheels, world record holders. I mean, they're just fucking jacked. And I walk up to Louie and Louie's probably, you know, I want to say in his late 40s, maybe early 50s at the time. And I said, hey, Louie, my name's Matt Winning. Um, I just won my first world championship as a teenager. I'd like to come over and pick your brain and train with you guys and possibly push it to the next level. And he kind of gives me a one-up looking down, and he's like, well, how strong are you? You know. And I said, well, I benched close to 500 You know, as a teenager. Told him my sixes in the squats and sixes in the deadlifts. He's like, oh, you're pretty strong. So he's like, come, up, come by sometime. And he was very open about putting his, back then the internet wasn't super big, if at all. He put out his phone number to all of the magazine articles. So about, I'd say, a couple of weeks go by, and I finally get the sack to call him. And I call him, and he answers, which is amazing, you know. He answers, and he's like, yeah, you know, we're going to squat on Friday. Come on down and squat with us. So I mix my schedule around, and at the time, I'm a welder at the hospital. I haven't been in college yet. Um, I haven't started school yet, but I was on my way. And I go over there to train with them, and it was one of the most opening experiences that I'd ever had. It wasn't a positive experience on face value. It was a positive experience way down low, and I'll explain. So I go in there and just happen to be there. were benching free weight that day, and I hit somewhere around 495 on the bench. Louie comes up to me and tells me how strong I am. Obviously, my form isn't perfect comparatively to the other West Side guys. And I remember George and Kenny Patterson come up to me and grab the back of my arm because at that time, training linear periodization and not understanding weak muscle groups and all these other things, my triceps were not nearly as strong as my pec and shoulders, which was causing me shoulder issues as a teenager. And George Halbert with Louie and him standing there comes up to me and is like, your triceps are fucking garbage. And at first I was kind of struck off. Like I was kind of mad deep down. I was like, man, fuck this guy, right? Like I, I benched 500 pounds as a 19 year old and this guy's telling me my arms are garbage. But after I swallow the ego for a second and think about what he's doing, I go over and talk to Louie. And I'm like, hey, Louie, you know, George says I need more work on my arms and they'll help my bench get better. What do you propose that I do? And he goes, well, you need a lot of dumbbell fold ins and you need a lot of, you know, kickbacks and blah, blah, blah. And he shows me like four or five exercises, what I can recall. Two, three months go by before I go back to Westside Barbell and I have been slamming these fucking triceps into the ground. So I started developing a lot of muscle around the elbow joint. You could see that I was putting in a lot of work. Once I did that and came back and George saw that what I told him as a negative, I turned into a positive and actually fixed the things he told me that I was neglecting, um, he was an open book. And so was Louie. And somewhat Dave. Dave was kind of slowly pushing out of Westside by that time. This is about 2000 now. And um, so now George is wanting to teach me anything I want to know because he's realized that I'm not an ego lifter. I'm there to get better. And if somebody tells me I have something that sucks, I want to fix it. I don't want to cry about it or hide. And I think that's a big problem that we have in society today. We tell people, oh, well, do what you're passionate about or do what you're good at. You know, in reality, conjugate system is about doing what you're not good at until it's a least and equal. And that's why I think the system has such a hard time with lifters today is the fact that, you know, Louie looked at me and knew that I was probably going to be a champion in 10 years, but not in 10 months. And I feel that that's very hard for people to sell. Louie was very, very good about making sure that people had their own timeline, so to speak. So as I get better, now I'm in the junior class or the, the um, um, you know, a collegiate level. So now I'm in my 20s, early 20s. I'm slowly adopting to everything that Louie's telling me as far as speed work is concerned, as far as doing max effort work, as far as just training with smarts, right? No longer doing a lot of burnout sets, getting faster to get stronger. Um, there's a lot of variables in that, but that was the basic change in my training. I was no longer building up to be stronger by doing reps. I was building up by being stronger to be faster and stronger. Long story short, um, I'm one of the only USAPL guys to break American records and national records as a 
conjugate system follower. I mean, you got to remember at that time, Borishiko and a lot of these other basically grind you to death specificity programs were the norm, just as they are again today. Um, and what I started to find was when I first adapted myself to the conjugate system, I would say the first year, I didn't really notice I got any stronger. So I could have basically refuted everything that Louis had taught me and went back to my old ways, which a lot of people do. But instead, I said, you know, screw it. I'm going to stick with this and see what it, see what it leads me. Well, by 2002 and three, now I'm a collegiate national champion. I have American records in the college, in the college ranks. I have the best team in college in the USAPL at Ball State, beating out huge schools like University of Texas, Louisiana Tech, all of these other schools that were very well known for being good powerlifting schools. A lot of that had come from Louis donating us reverse hypers and glued ham raises at Ball State to be used not only for athletics but also powerlifting. For myself and a few others, we were the first school that allowed the powerlifting team to train in the athletic weight room, and a lot of that was due to Louie donating equipment to the weight room for us to use that allowed us to have access to not only a recreational weight room, but the weight room that a Division I football team was training at, which I was 100% appreciative. 2003 is kind, of a, is kind of a weird area. I'm getting ready to graduate. I had one collegiate nationals. I'm one of the best collegiate lifters that the USAPL had ever seen. Um, I was already ranked in the top five as a men open lifter, and I was still a junior. Um, and Louie, I would say one negative thing, um, Louie was trying to talk me out of getting my graduate, uh, my master's degree. He's like, ah, you don't need that fucking shit. It doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. And that was the one time that I was actually glad I didn't listen to Louie. And there's some other stories we're going to get into that good thing I did not listen but so I ended up going into grad school, getting accepted as a full GA, no bills. I had to pay for school as my master's because I had worked so hard as in my undergrad. And um, I ended up doing my master's degree. Well, 2004, the first year of my graduate level, it wasn't that hard um, as far as my, my last year of graduate school, finishing my, my thesis was a total pain in the ass. So I was one of the youngest kids to squat 900, at, especially under 300 pounds body weight. I squatted 903 at 275 in 2004, uh, putting me at one of the top. You got to remember, a thousand pound squat at that time was unheard of. Only a handful of guys had even done it. 2005 comes around. I don't really compete much because the school is just killing me. So by the time I get out of school, I am just nopping at the bit to get back into what I love and what my passion is, which is powerlifting. So in 2005, I finished my graduate degree. From Ball State University and I directly within the month move over to Columbus, Ohio. Now, not only am I a part-time lifter at Westside from 99 to 04, I'm a full-time lifter in 05. This had a different level and this is where I think Louis was really good and bad in certain ways. He was really good to guess and really bad to people that were full-time and what I mean by that is the way he would treat you. If you were a, a guest lifter and showing up once or twice a month it was all positive feedback, it was all coaching, it was all helping. Once you became a part of the team, then it was up to you to prove that you deserve to be there. And I did. So in 2006, I win the 308s at, at um, APF Senior Nationals. I get into my first WPO semifinals. Um, I, I am one of the best lifters in the world. Um, one of the greatest memories I ever had was in 2006 at the same timeline, um, Louie comes in, and or we go to the APF Senior Nationals, and it's my first meet that I squat 1,000 pounds. And um, the guy that tried it before me injured two spotters and basically scalped his head dumping the bar. So they strip the weight back down, put it up in the rack, reload 1,003, Chuck's rewrapping my knees, Louie's blocking me from watching this guy basically get his fingers picked up off the floor and, and, and you know hauled off by the paramedics. They put the weight back on the bar, and Louie comes up to me, and I, I'll never forget this, and he's like, if you get this squat, this is the ballsiest squat I've ever seen anybody do. I just watched a guy get his fingers crushed. I just watched a guy basically almost rip his head off with a 1,000 pounds. They put it back in the rack, and I get five minutes before I have to do it, the same weight. So it's difficult because you're watching a weight that almost killed a handful of people, and now you have to do it. So what do I do? I fucking do it. And Louie's all super excited and crazy pumped. I finally hit the 1,000-pound squat, you know, and I think I was the 
I want to say the sixth guy to do it from West Side, and I was only maybe the the sixteenth guy to ever do it. Um, and so, 2007 is where things with Louie and I start to kind of change. So I, at 2006, I'm lifting, I'm working just enough to pay the bills, but I don't have a lot of money. I'm broke as shit, honestly. Um, and I'm working at a local gym at at Lifetime just as a trainer because I have a master's degree, but I wanted to put lifting first. And 2007, a great strength coach by the name of Buddy Morris comes by. Buddy Morris at the time was the head strength coach of the Cleveland Browns. And Louie's talking me up because I had just squatted this big 1,000-pound squat. And uh, Buddy Morris is talking to me, and I start talking about bands and accommodative resistance and the percentages of speed work, and he realizes I know my shit in and out. So he starts talking to Louie, unbeknownst to me, that he wants to hire me at the Cleveland Browns as his main assistant. Because Tommy Malinsky, which has been a strength coach in the pros now for like the last 20 years, was getting ready to move to a different job. And so I am in line to be first assistant. Well, Louie comes and asks me about this, and I'm like excited as all get out. I'm only out of graduate school one year, and i am already got an in into the pros. Unheard of. And I'm so excited for this job, but Louie senses my excitement, but then also senses that maybe I don't take powerlifting as serious as I once did because this is a career move, which is going to put me in Cleveland full time and put powerlifting on the back burner, which it would have. So at that point, I started to notice that Louie was treating me differently. Um, I'm starting to write more articles for Powerlifting USA. Um, I'm starting to answer all the emails for Westside Barbell, as you guys know, although Louie's co-written a lot of books he wasn't very good at English and not very good at writing so a lot of us at that time were writing the articles and even if it was for Louis to publish we were doing a lot of that stuff at the same time I am personally developing a um, a certification process and in the certification process um, we're writing up basically it's essay questions only you have to write 10 essay questions that are randomized and 25 different questions. So if all five of us say we're sitting around taking the same test, we would not get the same questions. With that being said, I wrote it to where it had to have an 85% pass rate to be certified. We gave it to all the guys at Westside Barbell, and the only people that passed it were myself, George Halbert, and Louis Simmons, and everybody else, even including the people at Westside Barbell, failed the fucking test. So, and I wanted to keep it that way because I wanted it to be ultra elite. Keeping in mind that I had done all the research, I had got all the books together, I had roughly about 150 hours in designing this testing protocol. Um, so we had a lot of little projects together that we were, we were planning futures on. Well, as Louis started to decide that I needed to be more, um, more successful in the strength conditioning realm, he started to sense that my my intensity in the gym wasn't as high, which was not true. So the next big kick in the balls was um, there was a big bencher that was holding. He had the world record at, I think, 242. Um, Bill, uh, I think it's not Bill Carpenter. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. The guy was a great bencher, and he had these certain techniques that he was using. Bill Crawford. He had these um, particular um, techniques that he was using in a denim shirt they were allowing him to bench in the 800s at 242, and we only, we only had one guy that could do that at Westside Barbell. So myself and another guy named Drex, which was a lifelong lifter of Westside Barbell, drove up to Michigan, took this course by Bill Crawford, um, keeping in mind my bench was a little under 700 at the time in equipment, um, and I learned these techniques. Before I leave the class, I bench press 745. So my bench press jumps up 50 pounds in about two hours just by learning these techniques. So with that in mind, I come back to Westside Barbell and I'm teaching Greg Panora, uh, Jeremiah Myers, and anybody else that wanted to listen on what I was learning. Two months later, I go to do a meet. J.L. Holdsworth is on the record board at 775 pounds in the bench, which was a hellacious bench at the time. Um, I do my first bench only meet and learn these techniques in fucking demolish 785. I mean, kill it. So now my name's on the record board as a bench guy, which is crazy because I'm a full meat lifter. 
Now, you would think that Louie would be insanely excited about that, but because I was using a different technique that Louie didn't necessarily agree with, it started to create a lot of animosity. Well, about, I would say, two to four months later, I start noticing that as we're ordering equipment from Enzer, briefs, suits, and etc., my legs were starting to get smaller because we were training in so much gear, my muscle wasn't getting a ton of work. So what I decided and improvised in my head with myself and Greg is that we were going to do a raw week, then a slight equipment week, and then a full equipment week. Keeping in mind that Louie was not happy about this at all. Big Iron was hitting monster numbers at different weight classes. They were pushing us as far as the strongest gym in the world out of Omaha, Nebraska, and he felt a lot of strain on that. He thought that what I was going to do was going to make guys weaker. But, again, proving that incorrect, Greg and I go to a meet in 2007, and I go from the seventh best in the world to hitting the third highest total of all time, and Greg breaks the all-time world record. Now, it's irrefutable that what I'm doing is working, and a lot of it was understanding how to recover and training a little bit more raw like Westside did in the old days that made it famous. This really created a big problem. So now we're in conjunction to train for another meet. Um, we do a raw day and a slight equipment day, which like briefs, and then a full equipment day, and then we rotate. And what that's doing is it's not only allowing the CNS to recover, because obviously you can't lift as much raw as you can in equipment. So my CNS is recovering, but my muscles are getting maximal overload. In my mind, it's ingenious. To Louis, it's completely asinine. So we're training for it, and all of it comes to a head at one, at one particular day. We're lining up the squats, and Greg and I are doing completely raw, belt-only uh, squats. We're working somewhere up around 700 and, like, some chain weight. I mean, we're talking big shit. And Louie has come in in a really bad mood, and we're training, and I'm in charge of the group, and Greg's listening to me, and Vlad is there, um, which now has, you know, the all-time rap records and shit. And we're basically, I'm designing it in the morning group. And uh, Louie's just constantly complaining and bitching about, yeah, this shit's not going to work, and I don't know why you guys are doing this, and blah, blah, blah. Keeping in mind, I am sauce to the fucking gills. I have a plan set that we've already proven works. Now it's time to really put it into play and make sure that it's it's foolproof, and Louie is not behind it one bit. So I'm pumped to train. I'm doing weights that are very difficult. I'm very focused. Louie is two feet away from me, basically talking shit about this cycle I designed, and I just snap on him. And I'm just like, listen, man, if you're going to stand around and just talk shit and not help us train, just go sit over in the fucking office while we lift, and we'll talk about it when we get done, but I'm not talking about it mid-set. So he's laughing it off and thinks it's funny because he got me pissed, but in deep down, he's fucking mad as shit because I basically just told him to fuck off in his own gym. And as soon as I initially did that, I was, I was, set, I was apologetic in my mind, but I was, you know, I knew I was on the right path. Not more than one day later, that's like we're lifting on a Friday or a Saturday when this happens. Sunday I come in and George Halbert comes in early, and I have my own office at Westside Barbell in the other side. George comes in and goes, hey, man, get a hold of me later today. And I'm thinking, that was weird. What the fuck? So about a half an hour later, I'm doing paperwork, whatever, and Louie walks in with um, some other guys and is just like, hey, man, I don't think you're going to work out here anymore. And I'm just like, well, what the fuck's that all about, dude? I'm like, um, you know, this is all about getting stronger and getting better. Um, so I was kind of, I was pissed pretty bad because I was thinking like, I just proved what I was doing was working. We were all getting better, but now you're upset about it. And uh, so Louie ends up kicking me out of the gym. And the last words that we had on that particular scenario was, Matt, you're done. You're not going to be any good. You know, you've already hit your best that you're going to be. Um, and, and I was like, well, watch me, motherfucker. You know, I'm going to go and do things on my own, and I'm going to kick everybody's ass. And he kind of laughs it off and thinks that he's got me because he's kicked me out of the best gym in the world. Well, long story short, a month before that, Louie had already had some, some issues with Chuck Vogelpool, and Chuck Vogelpool had already left. So I, And Chuck was my training partner. So I called Chuck, and I'm like, where are you lifting at? I need to train with you. I'm on a vendetta to fucking kick some ass. Chuck is ecstatic because now he's like, Matt, he's like, you have great ideas. I know you know what you're talking about. Let's form a team together. We called it Team Extreme. Let's form a team together and let's fucking kick some ass. So under the radar, we don't post a lot of workout videos. We're not posting a lot of things because that still is in its infancy at the time. 
And about seven months later, we show up at Louis Simmons' West Side Pro-Am in Cincinnati. I break the all-time world record in total. I had one of the highest bench presses ever as a three-meat lifter at 815 pounds. I had squatted 1,085 and then pulled enough to break the all-time total record, beating out um, Paul, I can't remember his last name, Paul Childress. Um, and that set me in stone as one of the greatest equipped lifters in the 308s of all time. Long story short, Louie had to hand me upwards of around five or $10,000 that day of his own money. And what really pissed him off is I had to rub it in his face, which I regret to this day. Um, we're standing there and the magazine's taking pictures of us together while he's handing me the money. And I said, I told you, motherfucker, I was going to come back and beat everybody at West Side Barbell. And he laughed it off again, but that just completely pissed him off and set him in a completely different direction that started the real animosity issue. A year goes by, I go back to the Cincinnati program again, and I stomp the shit out of everybody again, taking my squat over 1,100. I don't think that I benched as much that year, but I then I finally got into the 800-pound deadlift club, which was one of the only guys that had squatted 1,100 and pulled 800 in the same meet. Um, that just added more fuel to the fire. And then, in my opinion, what Louis started to do was to go to backwoods meets that didn't have the right judging and started getting guys like Hoff and A.J. Roberts and all them to start doing meets that I wouldn't say necessarily were technically sound. So they were also they were getting stronger, but they weren't getting stronger in the old, you know, below parallel squats, pause, bench presses, et cetera, et cetera. And not naming any, not really busting anybody's balls. This is old news. It doesn't matter. But at the, at the end of the day, I think that was a really big blow to Louie. But by 2011, I'm smelling the writing on the wall that there's big backlash against gear. So I do my last geared meet in 2011, breaking the all-time world record in the squat at 1,197.6 pounds. Keeping in mind, this was the biggest squat ever done at Westside Barbell, beating out Chuck Vogelpool and all the legends before that time. With proper judging in a meet that nobody cared if I passed or failed, I had no friends. I drove seven hours away to do this meet so that I knew that the judging was going to be fair and not be biased. With that being said, you start seeing Power Magazine and Power Thing USA really starting to push the raw lifters and put them on the front covers. I knew that with that style of training that Louie and I disagreed on, which was train raw, you know, at least once or twice a month, what I started to notice was is that switching over to raw was not a big deal. Actually, in some ways, it was an advantage because I was used to lifting 1,200 pounds on my back, and now the all-time world record in the squat was 826 um, in just knee sleeves and a belt. So I go to my first raw bench press competition and smoke 600 locally. When I do that, that puts me at one of the top benchers as a powerlifter of all time getting me up there with the likes of Kaz Meyer and Ted Arcidi and those guys. Um, and so now I really have steam under my belt. With that being said, um, Louis Simmons and I's relationship to that point was very distant, and we only ever ran into each other um, you know, in public, occasionally at a Texas Roadhouse or a Longhorn eating. And so from 2012 to present, I probably only ran into him five or six times. Now, in that five or six times, he had written a book on Westside Barbell, actually mailed it to me, and uh, wrote a pretty cool, um, you know, letter in, in it about, you know, he was proud of me, which was cool. Um, but with all that being said, um, you know, I had actually reached out and tried to call him about two or three months ago uh, just to kind of try to make amends, go over there, shake his hand, at least thank him for what he started to help me with. And uh, we never got to that point. But uh, with that being said, Louie was a huge integral part of my 20s. Um, he is still someone that I piggybacked a lot of information off of. Um, I feel that my higher education allowed me to dig into the books and understand them maybe a little bit more. Uh, and that can be, that's opinion, that's an opinion. But what I started to figure out was is that I would have never been introduced to that level of education knowledge or experience and I would have also never been able to adapt myself into um, a world-class lifter or a world record holder if Westside Barbell would not have been a part of my life. 
So being a member from uh, 1999 to 2007 was a huge portion of not only my success as a person, but my success as a lifter and my education as a coach. So I feel that Louis Simmons shouldn't be forgotten, although we didn't have agreeances on certain things. It doesn't mean that he was right or I was wrong or vice versa. Um, I just feel that um, us only being about a mile apart and being that distant, it really sucked, you know. Um, I feel that if we could have blended ourselves back together, we probably could have fixed a lot of things. Um, I know that he saw me as a good coach. He told a lot of people that he didn't have to tell that I knew what I was talking about and what I was doing. So I really appreciate that, and I feel that anybody that's trying to learn how to train or trying to understand how we do conjugate, although it's not very similar to how I do things, I feel that it's something worth the study, and I feel that his name needs to live on. So I will talk to you guys later. Uh, please go visit Westside Barbell's website. Look at the stuff that they got going on. Look at the stuff that Winning Strength got going on. Look at the similarities and differences, and you'll find that Really, there's not a lot of differences to be had. Small intricacies, small things. Uh, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't have been the person that I was without him. So thanks, Louis Simmons. Thanks, Westside Barbell. And we'll talk to you guys later. Lately, I've been living like I can't take a loan.